Well, I'm not an expert. I'm not an authority. I'm someone who has been a murderer for almost 20 years. Maybe I should have killed four or 500 people, then I would have felt better. People say Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. There must be something in that. I showed emotion. You know what people said? See, you really can't get violent and angry. Welcome to The Squonk and the Hag, a podcast about murder, mystery, the supernatural, and even a conspiracy or two. Dun, dun, dun. My name is Mo. And I'm Kraken. Welcome in, guys, to the final episode of The Squawk and the Hag for 2022. It is, it is the year that is new. What? What better way to, to end it with, than with a cracko tale? I'm still trying to digest it is the year that is new. I mean, this is me we're talking about? Were you surprised? You shouldn't have been. I, sh- I shouldn't be. I shouldn't be. Nothing should ever surprise me with you. The winter festivities should be wrapping up for most people, so we hope that you all had a lovely holiday. And we hope that you didn't get taken by Krampus, uh, because if you did, you you wouldn't be listening to this. And then we are hoping everybody this upcoming weekend has a lovely and happy new year. Yes, the year that is new. But yes, this week is a crack yo tale. A crack yo tale. Crack yo tale. Yes, this week is a crack o tale. So I'm going to hand it on over and you can tell us all sorts of wonderful, happy things with puppy dogs and. Oh, yeah, because that's that's always. Yeah, that's that's crack o tales. Just, you know, happy stories with wonderful endings. Mm hmm. Nothing creepy at all. No. Never. We got an interesting one today. We got Mothman. Is is it just some guy who really likes light bulbs? I mean, it could be. Uh, that's how I got kicked out of Home Depot. <laughs> I was not prepared. Ma- management management didn't take too kindly to me in my homemade moth costume dive bombing into the light section at the Home Depot. There were so many broken light bulbs. <gasps> wasn't doing a dance on the light poles in there, you know, like it's in, in full Mothman costume. Like it's it's fine. Just I wouldn't worry about it. I can no longer go to my local Home Depot. And no one is surprised. Hey, we broke Mo this early. That's a new record. Yeah, usually it takes you a while to get warmed up. It's probably because you were late tonight. I was busy warming up in the light section at Home Depot. <laughs> and and then they, they then they had to, you know, shoo me out of the parking lot with a broom because I just I tried to climb the light poles in the parking lot. <sighs> you could probably just lured me out with like a flashlight or something. Or a cookie. That too, but I was in moth mode. That's actually how we got my one niece to walk. She she was like was terrified to not Moth mode? No. Cookie. I mean honestly same. Yeah, she was terrified to let go. And then my mom was just like, you want a cookie, Shelby? And that kid was like, oh, hi. Hi, yes, it is I walking. Give, give me cookie. I wish people like I miss the simple things of childhood. Like I want somebody to give me a cookie for walking three steps today. I mean, we, we can do that. Yeah, and we don't. I want someone to give me a sticker because I tried. I could probably figure out some way to get you like a cookie dispenser that like gives you a cookie when you press a button. So like I got out of bed today. Just press the button. Now you have a cookie. Yeah, but that's not the same. Me giving myself a cookie isn't the same as somebody being like, oh, you you didn't give yourself that. The the machine did. You just pressed a button. Yeah, but I I still I still did it. I triggered the action. I. I didn't have, like, my mom look at me and go, oh. I will inform Chris to give you a cookie whenever you get out of bed or do something. You made it to the computer. Here's a cookie. I'm okay with this. You clocked into work. Here's a cookie. I don't have to clock into work. I'm salary. You're working. Here's a cookie. And next, I will be on my 600 pound life because I just get a cookie every five minutes. (laughs) Fair enough. I mean, you're not wrong. Cookies. I realized this isn't the story of Mothman, what we're talking about. I was like, we got the story of Mothman, and then somehow we ended up talking about cookies. How did this happen? I don't know, but Chris is making Jell-O no-bake cheesecake tonight. I'll be waiting for mine. Yeah. Anyway. But no, when you said this isn't Mothman, I thought you meant the the research notes, and I'm like, it says Mothman. No, no, what we were discussing was not Mothman. That was just more rambling, as we do. 
And you're surprised. Why are you surprised? How are you surprised? How long have we been doing this? A while. And what do we do every single time? We ramble. It's kind of like kind of like a thing we do. It's it's almost like there's a pattern here. Yeah. Anyway, and time to talk about creepy things in the woods. The first sighting of our uh, our friend the Mothman here was on November 12th, 1966. Two grave diggers were working in a cemetery in uh, Clendon, and if I'm pronouncing that right, it looks right, West Virginia. They spotted a massive figure moving rapidly through the trees overhead. Was there a country road? Probably, and when they saw this massive figure moving through the trees, they, they probably wanted to go home. <laughs> And, and they were probably screaming for Mountain Mama to take them home. <laughs> but they described this figure as a brown human being. But uh, that one, the, the first sighting with these two grave diggers was re- really short. There's not much. There's not much else. They just saw a brown human being in the trees. Just moving rapidly through the trees. It gets more interesting later on, specifically three days later after after that incident, November 15th. 1966, uh, two couples from Point Pleasant, West Virginia, Roger and Linda Scarberry, and Steve and Mary Mallett were driving just outside of town in the McClintic Wildlife Management Area. It's kind of like a, a government-owned area that is also known as the TNT area oh. because it's the site of a former World War II munitions plant. I just want to say that Roger, Linda, Steve, and Mary just, like, it just screams like a 1966 double date it does like i i imagine like they got the the big old like chevy you get the convertible yeah and like um one of uh, one of the women has like one of the silk silk scarves over her hair so it doesn't get messed by the wind with like the big sunglasses yeah, yeah the big white sunglasses that like kind of yes. are tapered out yes yes and the guys are wearing like like gray suits like Oh my god, it's just like stereotypical, like when you think of the 60s, like the, not the late 60s, the late 60s yes. is when the, the hippie movement and like the, the sex, drugs and rock and roll and like the. So they could have very well been in, been in like a van, just like a hippie van, and it could be completely opposite from what we're thinking. Um, no, this, this would have been right before all that started, you know, like the, the Sergeant Pepper uh, era was more of like 68, 69, I think. I'm going with our description. That That's that's more accurate. I'm just going with that one. <laughs> I love how you're like, that's more accurate when we have no idea. Yeah, we, we <laughs> have no clue. They, they, they could have just been not dressed like this at all, but... It could be like a bunch of homeless people in a Flintstones car. It is now canon in my mind. <laughs> you gotta spruce it up a little, you know, make, make it like put some sprinkles on it. Mm, I love sprinkles. <laughs> but uh, th- these these people saw something else in, near this uh, munitions plant because, you know, who, who doesn't go on a double date near a World War II munitions plant that is no longer in service? Oh, I know that's exactly where I want to go. That just screams romance. Of course it does. You know, the, the TNT area. It doesn't sound dangerous at all. I mean... The only thing that it's missing is like barrels of toxic waste, like spilling over Ninja Turtle style. That's honestly what I imagine when I think of this place. It's just <laughs> an old concrete bunker just in the middle of the woods, just barrels of green ooze just all over the place. Some of it's glowing. Well, you know what? You just have to tell Bobo you got a surprise for her. And you can take her to the McClintic Wildlife Management Area. Which call the TNT area. That's you got a surprise in store. We're going to the World War II munitions plant. Anyway, we have a little bit better of a description with this double date than just a brown human being. When whenever it was caught in their headlights, they, they said they saw a large gray creature following their car. So it went from a brown human being to a gray creature. I, I don't I don't know how um, we changed there, but um, was Bigfoot visiting Mothman? Possibly the first time they could have been on a date in the TNT area. You know, who knows? So because when I think of a large brown human being cryptid, Bigfoot, Bigfoot. Yeah. And then Mothman is gray or black or whatever color this moth is. Although aren't moths usually brown? Yeah, mo- most moths, yeah, you know, like a tan color. It could have been what they meant by brown. True. But um, yeah, they, they described it as a large gray creature following their car. And they said when it when they would 
like their headlights would pass over it, its eyes glowed red, and they described it as a large flying man with 10-foot wings. Big wings. Because that's something you see every day. Oh, yeah. Now, when they say the eyes glowed red when caught in their headlights, is it like a cat or a dog when you get the headlights or you know any light that's what some people think is that it's it was some sort of animal and then it was like the red eye effect like when you take a photo with the flash on you know some people's eyes will glow will look like they're glowing red but it's just the effect from the camera yeah and the lighting hmm. so okay. i mean it, it could be that or it could ha- actually have red eyes who knows but uh, during the next few days, more and more people began reporting similar sightings. I don't know if this is a case of they saw it. I think I saw something, too. Or if they actually did, there were more people seeing things. Yeah. But uh, two fo- two volunteer firemen were among these people who reported sightings who said they saw something that was described as a large bird with red eyes. They just all kind of have the same description. It's a large winged thing with red eyes. But uh, and yet nobody has come out and said dragon. No, they they just immediately went with moth. I don't I don't know how that started, but you know, but the the county sheriff at the time, George Johnson, he believed that the sightings were just an unusually large heron. That, that's a really big bird. It's just just a large bird. <gasps> if it's got ten foot wings, yes. What if big bird just rolled around in the mud? Yo, big big bird fell off his bicycle and he just like rolled around and down a hill, got covered in some leaves and sticks. It's possible. N- New Sesame Street episode: Big Bird gets lost in Point Pleasant. Where was Big Bird in 1966? It's the story of how Mothman came to be. He just he just got covered in mud, sticks, and leaves, and it's, it's just Big Bird. <laughs> That's that's the end. Of the, we can just stop there because that's just that's it. Hey, we solved it. Mothman has been discovered. It's Big Bird. But the sheriff thought it was an unusually large heron. But contractor uh, by the name of Newell Partridge, he thought otherwise and told Sheriff Johnson that they had shined a flashlight at a creature in a nearby field and its eyes glowed, quote, like bicycle reflectors. And Partridge also seemed to think that the creature was responsible for the buzzing noises that were coming from his TV and for the disappearance of his German Shepherd. So apparently this thing interferes with with TV signals and also steals German Shepherds, apparently. Okay. I, I don't I don't know why he thinks it's interfering with his TV. I don't know if he thinks it's just flying and landing on his house and messing with his antenna. Yeah. So like the, the dog disappearing. I can understand monsters. A lot of times they are either believed to or do eat people's pets. Uh, Buzzing noises coming from his TV. I feel like a tube was going bad in his TV because this was back in tube televisions. Yeah, because there's there's literally nothing else that talks about the Mothman causing interference with TVs or electronics. That's just this guy. Now, the disappearance of the German Shepherd, I can understand because like owls will go after small animals. Yeah, yeah. A lot of carnivorous birds will eat small mammals. Yeah. Like specifically not just lizards and stuff like that. They'll go after, you know, mice and rats and stuff like that. So the larger the bird, the larger the prey. Yeah, because there's a a meme that I have seen several times that I refrain from sharing because I don't know what the ending is of that meme. It's basically a cat little little off the ground with an owl above it and it's just like hey look, my cat got accepted into Hogwarts. So I'm choosing to believe that everything was fine in that meme. I'm just going to go with everything is fine. It got away. The owl left. And this is a happy ending. That's what I'm choosing to tell myself. Or it got into Hogwarts. Or or that too. It actually did get into Hogwarts. It was taking McGonagall home. Yes. I'm going with that. Even even though it's that kind of image, it, it still kind of makes me laugh because yeah, it got into Hogwarts. But I'm choosing to believe the happy ending of that story or of that meme. We'll just go with that. But um, since the the sheriff was thinking that uh, this was just a a really large bird, a wildlife biologist named Robert L. Smith from the West Virginia University decided to look into this a little bit and told reporters about these descriptions and sightings. It, It says that they seem to fit the description of the Sandhill Crane, which those those birds can vary from about two foot seven inches to roughly four foot six inches uh in yeah in in non-freedom units that would be 80 to 136 centimeters and their wingspan is about seven feet or 213 centimeters that's a big bird so it's 
There are very large birds, apparently, so not quite as big as Mothman, but pretty close. They're like if you were to see something like that that you're not used to seeing at a distance, you probably think it's larger than what it is, I guess. Did they ever think that maybe it was a pterodactyl? Welcome to Jurassic Park. <laughs> Where's my flute? Where's my recorder? I was going to say, where's the melodica? Yes. It just gets worse as you go. And funny enough, the uh, the Sandhill Crane actually has reddish colored circles around their eyes, too. So there's that. W- would it reflect, though? Because the other ones were I like... I doubt the feathers would reflect. It doesn't seem like something that would reflect, but I mean... Yeah, because they said it like reflected the light and glowed. Yeah, they said it, it glowed like bicycle reflectors. Yeah, so... so... But then again, this guy also, the guy that said they glowed like bicycle reflectors also said it messed with his TV. Fair. So, uh, who knows? But it's if it was a bird, it's possible that the, the bird wandered out of its normal migration route and went unrecognized because it wasn't native to the region. So, I mean, there's one possibility. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, as for the name Mothman, around the time that these sightings were happening, uh, the Batman TV series was popular. And even though the villain didn't make an appearance in the show, it's thought that the newspapers were influenced by the name Killer Moth from the Batman comics and decided to call him Mothman. Okay. Okay. That was the first I had ever heard of where the name Mothman came from. I didn't, I don't know why I never questioned it. I was just like, all right, it's Mothman. That's that. I don't, I'm not going to worry about where it came from. I figured they called it Mothman because it was a giant Mothman. That's what I, that's what I assumed. But apparently no one, no one that see that saw it ever called it a moth. They were just like, it's, it's a large humanoid creature with large wings. They never directly called it a moth. Fair enough. But this is where things get a little a little sad in the story. Uh, about 8.3 miles, roughly 13 kilometers away from the area where Mothman was first sighted, uh, was a bridge known as the Silver Bridge. And on December 15th, 1967, this bridge would collapse due to a defect in a single I-bar 330 link. So it's like those, uh, you see like the old metal bridges that have like just it's just a metal frame Mm -hmm. over the like along the sides and top of the bridge Mm -hmm. it was one of those and a single link in that in that metal framing had a defect and the way it was built if one link broke the whole thing would just break in like a domino effect so under the weight of rush hour traffic because this bridge was built a while back I, didn't, I don't remember the date i don't think I, I don't think i saw a date of when this bridge was built but uh it wasn't built up to code and it wasn't meant to hold the weight of modern day cars and uh under the weight of rush hour traffic this bridge collapsed due to this defect and this caused uh well and the thing that you you mentioned the weight of modern cars you think about in the 50s and 60s yeah everything was sheet metal yeah. Nowadays, cars are have a lot of fiberglass and synthetic or alloy materials that are lighter weight, and our kill our cars are still really heavy. You know, it's like a ton or whatever. So back then, they were probably almost twice as. Yeah, heavy. I think I think something that I had read. I don't know why I didn't include this in here. I I don't I don't know why, but anyway, it was meant to hold like the lighter car like the original like model a cars and stuff like that it was meant to hold those and then cars got made out of a little bit more heavier materials and it was and it wasn't properly maintained it wasn't inspected it had a lot of issues and then this single defect caused this bridge to collapse and uh with this rush hour traffic it caused the deaths of 46 people two of which were never found Oh God! But it was it was also noted that the defect was just a single crack. It was zero point one inches deep, about two point five millimeters deep. So that 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 teeny tiny little crack caused the, the whole bridge to collapse. If that tells you anything about how it was built. Yeah, that's terrifying. 
but they eventually replaced this bridge in 1969 and they put up the silver memorial bridge i think they built it similar to how the original one looked but this one's obviously a lot more sturdy than the other one yeah yeah but because of that incident that bridge collapsing was what started the whole mothman thing that's kind of what kickstarted the whole thing because some believe that mothman either caused the collapse and others believe that he was trying to warn people that there was something wrong with the bridge yeah maybe mothman like some people believe one thing some people believe another so maybe mothman's just really nice and was like guys get away get away and they yeah, just until until i got to digging in it a little bit i i didn't know this but apparently people have seen a mothman like creature before a bunch of other big incidents that I didn't know about. Oh. But unfortunately, some of these stories, I was unable to find proof because of how old they are Mm -hmm. and how difficult some of that stuff was to track down because there's no documentation. So these are just kind of like taken at face value. The further back you go in time, the less records there are. And I know anytime I kind of start looking into like some historical thing and I... Personally, I've only ever gone back to, I think, the like late 1800s. You go back even further. Like, I've I've watched some things on stuff that happened in like medieval times. And I'm like, how did you find out what happened when like I can barely find out? <laughs> exactly. Because I've got a story on here that the, the oldest story that I have on here about with a sighting is from 1926. And then I've got one from 1978. Those two, there wasn't really much information on those. What well, one of which, or a couple of them, I'll explain as we go on down. But um, there's like three different sightings that I'd never heard of until I started researching this. One of the fun things about research is because you you do find these like really these like you you know a general story, and then you start digging and you find out all this other stuff, and then it's just. I think it's awesome. It's sort of like looking through a keyhole. You can only see so much and then you open the door and it's just like, there's a whole other room over here. (laughs) Usually that's what happens when you open the door. There's something on the other side. And researching a story when you've previously only looked through the keyhole of the story, you open the door when you start researching it and you're like, all this is in here. Fair enough. That's how doors work. (laughs) That's how doors work. There's like other rooms on the other side. I love because I send you like we record and then I I don't edit for a couple days. And like when I go back and start listening, you send me quotes. I send you some of the weirdest quotes. And a lot of them I forgot I even said because like some of them I look at it. I'm just like, I said that really? (laughs) <laughs> yes, you did. Uh, like you recently sent one that just says, let's see if I can find it really quick. Uh, it's just, yes, don't eat the police. <laughs> and I'm like, where did that even come from? I don't even remember saying that, but it sounds like something I would say. So I'd believe uh, it. It was last week when we were talking about aposematism, ah, aposematism, which is the coloring of different objects in nature. And I was saying about oh, yeah, yeah. the the red and it means caution and the yellow means caution. And then you're like, I, I remember now <laughs> you're like, wait, the police are poisonous. And I was like, no, <laughs> don't eat the police. <laughs> yes. Don't eat the police. Fair enough. Yeah. There's going to be so many quotes from this that I'm not going to remember in several weeks. <laughs> well, yeah. So like next week when I'm editing and whatever, I'll send you something of that's how doors yep. work. <laughs> and I'll be like, yeah, fair enough. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Hey guys, it's Mo here, and I wanted to take just a second to talk to you about Anchor.fm. When Kraken and I decided to start the podcast, we had no idea what we were doing, and we went out there and searched to see what we could find to help us, because you have to not only create the audio and the podcast itself, but you also have to upload it to all the different services, and... How do you do that? So we found Anchor and it has been a godsend. Anchor has tools that allow you to record and edit right from your phone or your computer. So you don't even have to have fancy editing software to do it. You can also, when using Anchor, you can distribute it to 
all the listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcast, and more. I know Stitcher's on there, Radio Public. It's amazing. And it's all in one place. If you guys followed me when I was streaming, you know that I am all about streamlining everything to a single application to do it all. And that is what Anchor does for us. Plus, big point here, Anchor's totally free. So you can either download the Anchor app from the App Store on your phone, or you can go to anchor.fm to get started. I highly suggest it, and I hope you will enjoy it if you, too, are starting your own podcast. I'm not the only one who dug a little bit into uh, the Mothman sightings and stuff like that. There's actually a, uh, an author uh, named John Keel. In uh, 1975, they wrote a book called The Mothman Prophecies. Uh, he's one of the ones that thinks that... Uh, I've seen the movie. I haven't seen the movie. I haven't seen the movie or read the book. I feel like I need to now. I haven't read the book, but I saw the movie. Movie is good. I need to look at the movie. Not that you would know since you don't watch movies. Clearly, clearly I don't. I'm trying to fix that. Although you watch seven I only now. recently saw I Am Legend too. I have actually it's haven't seen good. that one. There's two I've endings, heard. two different endings to the movie. I've heard, I, I've heard it's good, I just haven't yeah who doesn't watch movies now bro come at me no because i will lose <laughs> anyway i haven't been watching movies lately chris and i've been watching um hockey and babylon 5 again mm, fair enough every like two years like actually no maybe like every year and a half we watch all five seasons of bab 5 bobo and i will get a random urge to just watch a series of movies back to back like the other day we watched both cloudy with a chance of meatballs movies just randomly okay I'm just browsing through netflix like what are we gonna watch oh look cloudy with a chance of meatballs they have one and they have two let's let's do both i mean why not exactly the only exception is when it is a series of movies where some suck yeah so like die hard you watch die hard one two three and stop indiana jones one, two, three, stop. But there's a certain point where it's like... Star Wars, original four, five, six, which is one, two, three. Well, one, two, three, which is four, five, six. Stop. Lord of the Rings. You know, watch the Lord of the Rings. Stop. Now, now, I will say the Hobbit movies weren't that terrible. I prefer Lord of the Rings. They weren't that terrible. Like, if I was going to have... Like, if I had to choose... Which one was more a uh, stab to my geek heart? Fair enough. Crystal Skull was far more offensive than The Hobbit. I will say the new Indiana Jones looks a little promising, but that is just from the trailer. So it looks promising, but I don't know. I'm not holding out hope because I don't think they needed any after The Last Crusade. No, no. After that one was just like, no, not really, but. No, because Indy, his dad, and Marcus rode off into the sunset. They had a lot of great adventures. Everything was honky dory. And then they just had to throw aliens in there. And then they're like, aliens. Apparently, there's a brand new National Treasure movie I discovered. (gasps) I didn't know that was a thing. It's on Disney Plus. Yeah, I thought there were only two. Oh no! Apparently, there's there's a third. Huh. It, I don't know. I don't know if it stars Nicolas Cage or not, because like the cover had had a lady on the cover. I don't know the actress's name. I don't I don't I'm not good with actress or actor names. Mm-hmm. I might have to check that out. All I can be like is they played this person in this movie. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. OK, so, yeah, sorry. Tangent over back to Mothman shenanigans. So John Keel wrote this book, Mothman Prophecies. He's one of the ones that believes that the sightings were bad omens about the bridge collapse. And uh, Keel also claims that residents of Point Pleasant experienced premonitions of the Silver Bridge collapse, as well as UFO sightings and even supposed visits from the Men in Black. The Men in Black, like it—it w- it was literally Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith. Yeah, yeah, it, it was—it was them. It was those two. They—they they got in full costume See and you come went into the character. Men in black. They got a little flashlight attached to a little stick and clicked it at some people. They were very confused after, so I guess it kind of worked. <laughs> But uh, on to some of the other sightings of this moth-like creature that I hadn't heard about until I started researching this. Apparently, Mothman was sighted right before the Chernobyl reactor exploded. That one was new to me, Uh, but they didn't call it Mothman. It was known as the Blackbird of Chernobyl. 
um, because it's several days leading up to the the Chernobyl disaster. Several workers in the control room claim to have seen this black bird, and it is said that the creature rose above the horizon of Chernobyl and Pripyat before the reactor exploded. And those that saw it and were able to give a description described it as a birdman-like being with big black wings and glowing red eyes. I couldn't find proof of this information following, but apparently those that saw it claimed to have had terrifying dreams, headaches, and would receive threatening phone calls from unknown callers. I guess trying to keep them quiet about it. And uh, some sources say that it was just callers where it was just like someone called you, you said hello, no one answered, and they just hung up after calling so yeah like a prank call or something that one was a little weird it was like all of these were just like very vague except for this next one uh which was in germany and gave a little bit more information and more of a description but this one kind of sounds a little fake but i'm i'm unsure um but that's that's why we that's why we do this is this why we do we, this we let the listener decide oh i thought i decided I mean, we can let you decide, too. I have decided that... Technically, you're listening. Cracker was a Ritz cracker. Fair enough. I couldn't think of anything. We'll, we'll stick with me being a Ritz cracker. This is fine. You're the Ritz cracker, according to my notes. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but I was like, oh. I don't know where that came from, either. I was just as shocked as you were. I was like, the Ritz cracker? Where'd that come from? Oh, that sounds like something we would do. Oh, that, that sounds like something that happened like a year ago. And we both forgot about Probably, or it could have happened last week. Who knows? But our next Mothman sighting was uh, the collapse of a coal mine located in the Black Forest Mountains near the city of Freiburg in Germany. Apparently on the morning of September 10th, 1978, coal miners would approach the entrance to the mine to start their workday, and they noticed a man wearing a dark trench coat standing in front of the entrance. Apparently this was me in my trench coat full of frogs. I don't, I don't know how I time traveled, but, you know. I always thought you had, like, a, the, the tan khaki trench coat, like the classic trench coat. I didn't realize it was a, black, a dark one. See, y- you never know. Or maybe I have multiple trench coats. Got to change the trench coat out, change it up a little. I mean, fair, fair. But this, uh, this, this trench coat wearing figure was just kind of standing in front of the entrance to the mine. And naturally, the miners were confused as to who this was and what he was doing here. So they decided to walk up to him and figure out who he was and what he wanted. And they stopped just a few feet away from the man because what they thought was a trench coat flew open and turned into a f- pair of massive wings. Because that's not horrifying at all. No, not not at all. Like, that's, yeah, that, that happens every day. Yeah. yeah and, and to make matters even better... They just kind of stood in shock at what they were seeing as this creature reportedly let out a series of extremely loud shrieks that witnesses described as sounding like 50 men screaming, combined with the sound of a train's emergency brakes. It's very oddly descriptive. (laughs) That's what I was thinking. I was like, that's very specific. It's like it was 50 men, not 49, not 51. It was 50 men screaming at the same time squealing train brakes very specific but um what also doesn't make sense is well to me it doesn't make sense maybe it does to someone else but the workers fled from the entrance and stopped at a safe distance they didn't continue running and call for help or anything like that they stopped at a safe distance from the entrance and just kind of watched this creature that they would it would later be named the freiburg shrieker uh, they watched its wings fold back around its body, and it just kind of stood at the entrance to the mine. So all of them stopped? Like, I could see, like, maybe one or two people being curious, but my ass would not be staying. There may have been a few that kept running, but the story that I found just said that the workers fled from the entrance, stopped at a safe distance... And no one knows why they didn't, like, report the creature to the authorities or, like, call the police or or anything like that. They just... Instead, they stopped at a safe distance and just started cleaning the area outside the mine. They were just like, let's just leave this thing alone and hope it goes away. We're just going to work outside the mine while that thing chills up there at the entrance. (laughs) That's why you're still around. Pretty much. I I wish I could have said that without laughing. Everyone just does things around me and they're just like, I'm just going to leave that thing over there and just 
hopefully it'll it will it'll leave us alone. Wait for it to go away. Exactly. And they're just they're just cleaning the area. I can just imagine like they're all just like moving carts around and stuff while just occasionally just constantly looking up at the at the entrance to the mine like it's still there. Is he still there? He's he's not like okay, he's he's not looking at me. Keep going. He's gonna move these rocks over here. Is he still there? He's still there. Don't look at him, don't make eye contact. Okay, next thing you know, they're doing a podcast with the Mothman. Just chilling in the background. <laughs> it's like, well, we tried to get rid of him, he wouldn't go anywhere, so we're friends now. Yeah. He, he, he now works in the mine. Hey, I mean, if you think about it, though, he probably would be really good at moving stuff. Probably. I'm sure you could, like, easily move those carts and stuff with with, uh, with ease. Get him a little mining helmet, you know, the one with the little, like, light That's on exactly it. That's exactly what I was picturing. <laughs> <laughs> and he just he just takes the helmet off and starts slapping at the light <laughs> on top of the helmet. Uh, supposedly, these miners, uh, they just kind of, they kind of waited for about an hour until around 8 a.m., when a massive underground explosion shook the whole mine and the ground around the mine. And so they, they they rushed over to the entrance to discover that this the Shrieker was gone and a huge pl- plume of smoke and flame poured out of the entrance of the mine. Uh, it, it was later determined that had the miners been at their designated posts inside the mine, all 36 of them would have died. Oh, wow. But this... As I said before, this particular encounter is, along with the other ones, it's, it's hard to confirm the exact location of the mine, as well as the, the mine workers and all of that. Like, there's no information other than what I just read. But uh, mm-hmm. trying to find information, I discovered that a Reddit user uh, that goes by the name of Torin Durr, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, they did some research for me, apparently, because I wasn't the first one to look into this. Without knowing it. <laughs> Without knowing it, they went ahead and did the work for me. So I was just like, well, this is good information. I'll, I'll give them some credit here. So that way I can, uh, you know, tell you what they found. Um, the the city that's in here was, I said it was Freiburg, but it's possible that it was a, uh, a typo because they found that the only city in Germany with a name that's similar is uh, similar to Freiburg is Breisgau. And there are only three mines in that area. So apparently there's no city of Freiburg that exists in Germany or that ever did exist in Germany according to Wikipedia articles and I guess wherever else you find information on cities. I don't, I don't know these website names. <laughs> I don't know how the internet works, Fair. but those three mines that, that were in that area, they were used for mining assorted metals and minerals and not coal. And uh, according to those Wikipedia articles, there are no reports of a mine disaster in that area during 1978. There's a lot of holes in the story in terms of where it was and and the mine and all of that, because apparently there's no record of a coal mine in that area around that time that collapsed. So, yeah, that one's a big has a big question mark on it, but it's still an interesting story. Yeah. And we have one another one that goes a little further back. It goes all the way back to uh, see where, where did I have the date here? January 19th, 1926. I thought you were going to say 1933. That's the date that I always go back to. Eventually, I'm going to have a story where everything is 1933. I mean, you try to make every other story about it, so you might as well just run with I it. Need, I need to find one from, from that year. It's got to be something good there if I keep trying to change all the stories. Except when I brought one that was in the 1930s, you're like, it's medieval time. Also, I see someone had edited my story and threw my name in here. I wonder who could have done that. I'm, I'm going to read it as it's written. Uh, so there's been sightings. As far as China, I'm, I have no idea how to pronounce this name. This is going to be butchered completely. Because uh, I think it's Zion de Tem. Nah. Zion, Zion to Dem. Well, the D-A-M word is literally just dam because it was it's actually a dam holding back water. Oh, OK. The Zion so, T Dam. Close enough. Almost overnight, people began reporting reporting seeing a large black winged figure that would eventually be called, and this is exactly how it's written here in, in the story, so it can't possibly be wrong, the Krakow Man Dragon of the Ritz variety. <laughs> yeah, because you shared the document with me, and I can I was like, he's never going to know, and he's just going to read it. Oh, no. How can I not know? I just look, and I'm like, wait, why is my name in here? I didn't do that. And I was like... Fair enough. I'm just going to read it like this. <laughs> the Krakow Man Dragon of the Fritz variety, you know. <laughs> yes. Not of the saltine variety. No, 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 no. The Ritz variety. <laughs> but they call this creature the Man Dragon. There is very little on this story. There's like one or two websites that even talk about this. 
Um, support, supposedly, this creature, the rumors began spreading around the small farming communities that were located around the base of the dam. Uh, some people say the creature was seen hovering above the dam and uh, on the afternoon of January 19th, 1926, at the, the height of the sightings, the dam had a massive structural failure and collapsed and spilled over 40 billion gallons or 151 billion, 400 million liters of water onto the villages below. When the when they finally got the water cleaned up and everything, they found that the death toll was over 15,000. Oh, my God. But due to uh, the political situation in China at the time, all records of the dam collapse and the sightings were destroyed by the current rule or by the ruling party at the time. So that's horrible. Unfortunately, there's no record of that. Because it's a situation of we don't want people to know that we had an error with one of our dams. So we're just going to cover that up. So, yeah, because that, that, that's, that's the way you, you handle something like that. Yeah, you just cover up your mistakes. If you deleted it. Never happened. Exactly. Apparently, it's true because there's literally only one or two articles that even talk about this. You try to Google Mandragon. There's just nothing. But uh, we even have one. Uh, I specifically copy pasted this. Uh, let me find my link here uh, so that way I can say exactly where I got this from. Um, I want to say it was the UFO Clearinghouse website that had this one. No, no, no. Phantomsandmonsters.com. This is where this story came from. There's actually uh, in the link that I posted in the... I don't know. I don't know if you want to include that anywhere with the post, but uh, there's like a ton of... Cracko, how long have you been a part of this podcast? For a long time. But since the beginning, I guess. Have you ever been to our website? Yes. Have you ever looked at the show notes for an episode? I forgot. Yeah, I always put the source links. Anyway, the Phantoms and Monsters link has uh, all of the stories of the Mothman sightings in Chicago. I, I picked out one here to read that was, wasn't too long, but it was a decent length. But there's like apparently hundreds of sightings of a mothman in chicago so apparently he lives in chicago now i mean i hear it's a nice yeah, city he just he just kind of like he tried out chernobyl he tried china it just it just wasn't he tried germany it just, it just wasn't hitting right so chicago just it's hit different i guess he didn't like their pizza i guess not at least it's not you know pizza without the toppings <sighs> like tomato pie tomato pie is not but, you know, pizza I mean, you got the, you you got the crust, you got the sauce. You're just missing the cheese. I mean, just... It is not a crust. It is a bread. Here we go. Okay, my dude, my dude. You have never, you have never been to Philadelphia or the surrounding area and eaten a tomato pie up here. You don't know what it is. It is not pizza. I'm going to specifically go into the the smallest like mom and pop shop down there that sells tomato pie. I'm going to try it in store and then I will out loud say, this is good. It's like pizza, but without the toppings. <sighs> and then I will be chased from the city. Or excuse me, I will be chased from the state. It... Okay, so... Yes? It is not pizza. It is a specific type of bread with tomatoes on top or crushed tomatoes on top. Now, you could one could argue that pizza dough is a type of bread, but this is and it also has crushed tomatoes on top. But it's not it's like if you took a loaf of bread and slapped spaghetti sauce on it and said this is a pizza. You act like I haven't done that with Lost Craft Singles and some pepperoni that I found in the bottom of the fridge. You act like I haven't done that when I want pizza at 3 a.m. But it's not an actual pizza. But I call it a pizza and it satisfies the pizza craving. Yeah, but <sighs> tomato pie is not a pizza. It's okay if you if you're wrong, like you know, it's it's fine. Okay, there there are so many Italian bakeries in this area right now that want to stab you in the face for this. There are many people across the <laughs> globe that want to stab me in the face right now. Do you realize how little that narrows it down? Yeah, but you can only get tomato pie from a bakery. You cannot get it from a pizzeria because it has to be... I am going to specifically open a pizzeria and sell tomato pie and I'm going to call it a pizza. 
and you can't stop me. And then you're going to be wrong because a pizzeria is going to sell tomato pie. And it's going to be literally pizza dough with pizza sauce on it and no, nothing else. Then it's not a tomato pie. It is if I call it a tomato pie on the menu. But it's not. But if you walk into this pizzeria and you order a tomato pie, that's what you're going to get. So technically, <sighs> I wouldn't be wrong. <sighs> it would not. Have a nice day. It would not be a classic Philadelphia tomato pie because it would not well, I mean you could argue that pizza that you get from Domino's isn't a classic pizza because you, if you go to like Italy and order a pizza uh, they're going to look at you like you're crazy and, and give you something that's not yes, what you think is but, pizza but this is a dish that you can get still traditionally in Philadelphia so Italian immigrants came to the Philadelphia area, settled down, and this is a traditional bread that you can now get in the, like, southeastern corner of the state. I mean, it goes out a little bit further than that. And it just so happens it's very similar to pizza, just with no toppings. It is not. It is far more like focaccia than it's like pizza. I mean, have you ever taken flatbread and putting pizza sauce on it and some cheese and pepperoni and you made a pizza that way? I mean, technically you can make pizza. That's a flatbread pizza. That's not bread. So, so, so basically tomato pie is like a flatbread pizza. <laughs> it is not any kind of pizza. I love where I've taken this conversation. <laughs> it is not any kind of pizza. It is a bread. It is a bread with some sauce. It is It is more like a breadstick than it's like a pizza. Pizza dough is, is a type of bread with sauce. So, Philly Mo's about to come out and I'm afraid. I'm gonna stop while I'm ahead. You are not ahead. You are not ahead. You are you are so far behind. You are in the wrong line. It's, it's fine. Tomato pie is similar to pizza, just like hot dogs are basically American tacos. Like, you know, it's fine. <sighs> It is at this point that Mo is imagining, imagining strangling me. So you know how I have a murder book? My name is in it. Gonna be. Yay, I made the murder book. <laughs> I mean, technically, if you think about it, when you if you just said tomato pie is basically it's a bread with tomato sauce on it, right? I'm trying to understand. Isn't that what you said? Yes, it is bread. It is a very specific bread, very similar to a focaccia. Okay, so it's it's, it's a bread with it with tomato sauce on it, right? Yes. So technically, if I make a grilled cheese sandwich and dip it in tomato soup as a cheese pizza, <laughs> because you got the bread, you got the tomato, you got the cheese, it's a cheese pizza. By your logic, yes. By my logic, anything can be pizza. Anything can be a taco. Anything is a sandwich. We talked about this before with like alchemy as, as as the world as I will it to be, so it is. With that kind of logic, anything can happen. Like, listen, if I go into the kitchen, that's basically a form of alchemy. I'm turning several things into a new thing. I love how this has now become alchemy. Cooking is just alchemy, and nuclear power is just boiling water. And like a burrito is technically like Southwest sushi. It's like it's still stuff wrapped up. Like I mean, fair. It's a roll. You hear that? That's my Advil. Oh right, I, I I made Mo just confused in the beginning. We broke her in the beginning, and now we got her on the Advil. Part two accomplished. I'm sticking with the fact with with the theory that cooking is just a different form of alchemy because you know you got the boiling water. If anything, it's like a witch's brew. You got the boiling water on the fire and you start throwing stuff in it until it makes something. That's, that's, in this whole conversation, that is the most accurate thing you have said. Cooking is like alchemy. Yeah, because you turn in several different things into one new thing. Yes, but you cannot turn a tomato pie into a pizza. <laughs> you watch me. I'm going to walk into the smallest mom and pop shop that sells tomato pie in, in, up there and then I'm going to pull out of my pockets, don't question where it came from, a bag of shredded mozzarella cheese and pepperoni, and I'm going to put it on the tomato pie. Yeah, but that wouldn't be a pizza because it wouldn't have been baked with the cheese and pepperoni on it. And then I will hop the counter and put it back in the oven. It would still just be bread with toppings. 
as pizza. No, pizza is a pizza crust of some form, which is made of specific ingredients. Pizza crust is just bread. It's not just bread. It's not just bread. How much of this is going to get cut out? I'm leaving this whole damn thing in. I don't care if this has to be a three-part episode. This is important stuff. Fair enough. I see what I've done here. Would you care to agree to disagree and head to Chicago for a Mothman story? Can we get pizza while we're there? Yes, we can get tomato pie. I mean, pizza while we're there. Chicago pizza is very, very different because that has cheese. Like, it's like a reverse. And that one has a chance of getting stolen by the Mothman. So we have one of many stories of the Chicago Mothman. This one, I, I just, like I said, I copy pasted the whole thing because I wanted to get their their point of view across here. Um, so it says, I'm writing this out after taking a day or two to really, really think out if I wanted to report this and tell others of what I saw the other night in Oz Park here in Chicago. I finally decided that writing this out and submitting it would be therapeutic to me and might hopefully help identify what it was that I saw and maybe help someone else avoid the same thing. I live in the Lincoln Park neighborhood in the city of Chicago and live about one and a half blocks from Oz Park. I hear that uh, in in the Lincoln Park neighborhood, uh, in the end, it doesn't even matter. You, you, you can try so hard and get so far, but, you know, in the Lincoln Park neighborhood, it doesn't even matter. <laughs> I miss Chester so much. Bro, same. Same. I had to throw the pun in there. I couldn't help it. But anyway, when the weather's nice... I usually go outdoors into the park to jog and walk my dog. But on the night of April the 7th, it was no different. It was mild. The cold weather had finally subsided, so I decided to give the treadmill a break and go outside to jog and let the dog get some fresh air. As I came to the corner of Burlington Street and Webster Avenue, where I crossed the street to the park, my dog began acting very peculiar and acted like she didn't want to go to the park. This is very strange because usually my dog goes absolutely nuts when we go to the park and has the time of her life running and sniffing. On this particular evening, she acted like she was mortified to cross the street and enter the park. As we crossed the street and came up to the area where the basketball courts are uh, at the start of the trail that goes around through the park, my dog was practically being dragged as she resisted wanting to continue. After much effort, I finally got her to cooperate and began walking. So I started walking east toward the Oz Garden, a route that is my usual when I come here to walk or jog. And as we walked toward the garden, I noticed that many of the birds you usually hear in the park were all but silent and that the only noise you could hear was the usual city noise from the surrounding neighborhood. As we rounded the sidewalk to head south with the garden to my left, I heard what could only be described as the flapping of wings. I really didn't give it a second thought as I assumed it would be some passing Canadian geese that I've seen in the park recently. But as we came toward the clearing where you would find the baseball fields, something caught my eye, and what I saw still scares the crap out of me. I saw a large man, probably seven feet or taller, standing on the ground, and it was solid black. But what really stood out were the large, and I do mean large, pair of wings that were folded behind him. These wings stood taller than the man by at least a foot and a half and jutted out of his back. I could not see its face, as it had its face turned away from me, but probably didn't notice me at first. It finally turned around and noticed me, and I saw the bright ruby red eyes that appeared to glow from within. It was at this time that it turned to face me, and I got to see what it really looked like. It was about seven feet tall, and instead of clothes, it looked like a giant half-man, half-bird kind of thing. Apparently, it reminded them of the character Bird Person from the show Rick and Morty, but a lot scarier. <laughs> I had the same reaction to that to that description. <laughs> Just a scarier bird person from Rick and Morty. This thing stared at me for about 15 seconds, which felt like an eternity, and then in a loud whoosh, it unfurled its wings and screeched really loud and jetted into the air. The wings looked almost bat-like and were at least 10 feet across from tip to tip. I felt like this thing could see right through me, read me, and it knew what I was thinking. Like it could stare right into my very soul. It was the most terrified I have ever been in my life. It rose into the air like a bullet and I heard it screech once more before losing it from my view as it rose above the trees and possibly the buildings. It was at that time that I realized I had yet to scream or react in any way. I was just numb. Numb from my head to my toes. I finished my walk early and walked home, all the while trying to see if I could see it again once I got to the street. So, apparently, Mothman just likes to chill in the park. I mean, wouldn't you? Yeah, you're probably right. He was just vibing. I was out for a walk, and man just had to disturb his walk. Maybe he was out for a good fly. Why are you making him walk? I mean, who am I to judge whether or not scary bird person from Rick and Morty wants to walk or fly? As always, make sure to check out our website for all the show notes, sources, and more information at thesquonkinthehag.com. 
and don't forget to like, subscribe, and bonk the notification bell to get alerts for new episodes and content. All right, Cracko, you ready? Okay, bye.